And uh, yeah, we're very happy to have uh, Susheta Majumdar here from Marseille, sunny Marseille, uh, who's going to give us a lesson uh, on going from the light cone, uh, from the light cone formulation of physics at, uh, at null infinity. Take it away when you're ready. <laughs> I have these, uh, these handy signs. That okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for such a wonderful conference and uh, for the opportunity to uh, present our work on a slightly older topic, uh, light cone formulation. Yeah, with, uh, light cone formulation of quantum field theories. And uh, what I will tell you today. It's going to be a very basic talk. I'm not going to talk about gravity or crystals or anything. Is, I will use some very simple examples to highlight certain features of light cone theories that might be relevant for physics at null infinity. And by physics at null infinity, of course, we, we mean this region of space-time, the asymptotic region, uh, in the broader context of flat space holography. And uh, this morning, we had two wonderful talks by Laura and uh, Homa on flat space holography where they repeatedly try to emphasize that these are early days, we have lots of challenges to overcome. I will not answer any uh, of those <laughs> challenges in this talk for sure, but I would uh, like to argue that maybe it, it, it would be interesting to look at a different setup where you have this kind of a situation where two uh, null hypersurfaces intersect in a co-dimension two space-like uh, surface and that is precisely the right cone formulation uh, of quantum field theory. It doesn't have to be gravity necessarily, so this is uh, just for any quantum field theory. And uh, historically, this, this dates back to the work of Dirac uh, from the forms of relativistic dynamics, the, uh, the famous paper, where he argued that there are different choices of time coordinate for, uh, for doing a Hamiltonian analysis uh, for relativistic theories. The usual one is, of course, taking uh, x naught to be the time then we have a, sp a spatial foliation of our space-time. But you could also take uh, one of the light cone directions, the x plus, to be uh, the time direction. In that case, you have a null foliation of the space-time. And also in GR, these uh, two correspond to qualitatively different initial value problems. So this one is the Cauchy problem, and this one would be characteristic initial value problem. And the uh, key point that Dirac wanted to emphasize in this paper is that uh, depending on how you choose your time coordinate, uh, your Poincaré algebra might have a uh, slightly different form. For uh, example, in the instant form case, we have a six-dimensional kinematic or stability group for this surface, and the dynamical part is four-dimensional. But if you choose uh, the x plus to be your time direction in the front form, uh, you have a seven-dimensional seven kinematic group. So the, the, the uh, stability group of this surface is seven-dimensional, and the dynamic, dynamical part of the Poincaré algebra is just three-dimensional. And this was uh, quite useful in, in certain cases, for, for instance, to derive uh, interacting actions, uh, interaction vertices in higher spin, th higher spin theories or supersymmetric theories and so on. So that's one of the reasons why uh, light cone formulation uh, can be interesting or useful. There, there is another important reason, which dates back to late 60s, uh, mid 60s, uh, which is that, uh, so uh, this was from the work of Weinberg, where uh, he showed that certain Feynman diagrams, which are typically badly behaved, they can uh, be simplified and they, in, in fact, give you finite or zero uh, uh, contributions if when looked at in the infinite momentum frame or in the light cone uh, frame. And, the, uh, and later, uh, Suskin showed that this this simplification comes from, a, from an underlying 3D Galilean invariance in the 4D theory. And a very quick uh, way to see this is just from the onshell condition. If you write the onshell condition in light cone coordinates, you see, so x plus is our time. The Hamiltonian p plus has this kind of a form, p squared by 2 uh, p minus, which is very similar to the non-relativistic formula for energy, p squared by 2 m. And in fact, in this uh, Galilean group, which I will show you at the end of the talk, uh, this p minus algebra is, uh, appears like a central extension, so like a mass, in fact. Another reason to look at light cone formulation is the following, that if you take uh, a null uh, time coordinate, the gauge constraints uh, often become solvable. So for instance, if you have the Hamiltonian action of a gauge system, 
with the usual PQ dot minus H uh, term, we also have certain gauge constraints which tell us not that not all the degrees of freedom are physical. Uh, in uh, using light cone gauge, uh, light cone coordinates, it's often uh, simpler to solve the constraint and elim eliminate some redundant degrees of freedom. So you can uh, come down to a basis of just the helicity states or physical degrees of freedom and so on. And uh, th these are some of the reasons why the light cone formulation uh, has seen many successes in the, in the past. But uh, as a disclaimer, I would like to remind you that this is a non-covalent formulation, so that some expressions are going to be a bit ugly. It's not as nice as a covariant formulation. But uh, what I want to show you is uh, how to approach the topic of asymptotic symmetries or how boundary conditions appear and so on in this light cone uh, framework. And then I'll, I'll tell you about some recent works, depending on how much time I have. Okay. So uh, let me take the example of electromagnetism because it's the simplest one. Here we are trying to fix the, the Maxwell action using the light cone gauge. So we set A minus, A lower minus component to zero. And as a result of that, we find that there, uh, one of the equations, Maxwell's equation will become a constraint. So this one has no del lower plus, so it's time independent. And you can integrate, this is a second order PD in X minus, and we can integrate uh, the A minus, uh, uh, we can solve for the A minus uh, component up to some integration constants. Now, uh, there is another equation which is just a trivial equation which will relate these two integration constants. So at the end of the day, there is one arbitrary constant in the game. For now, let me set them to zero. I'll come back to the point later what happens or if there is a price to pay. And the reason this is typically done is that if you do this, if you set them to zero and everything, then uh, what we are left with is just the two propagating modes of the uh, photon because you have this box AI equals zero uh, like equation of motion. You can further combine them in, in a complex basis, then you get some helicity states. So in the Poincaré algebra, you have plus minus uh, one eigenvalue for these states, and the, the Maxwell action will simply look like this. This is also called the LC2 formulation because you have gotten rid of the two uh, degrees of freedom which are not related to propagation. Now, uh, let me come to the boundary conditions. So, so far, I have not talked about boundary conditions at all, but I just told you that there is uh, some ambiguity about how you fix the integration constants. And there is this uh, one uh, function which is sort of arbitrary, but it turns out that these integration constants are uh, related to the uh, boundary condition of the fields at large x minus. So x plus is our time, so x minus is sort of like a spatial direction, but in order to uh, Solve the, uh, in order to get the solution space, we have to uh, precisely mention what is the boundary condition of these AI fields. And this is where the arbitrary constant appears as the order one, uh, uh, order one, one term in the boundary uh, condition for AI. And the way this affects the symmetries is the following. So let's say I set them to zero like I did in the previous slide. Then I'm taking a weaker fall off. Uh, no, I'm taking a, a stronger fall off, sorry. Uh, where a, AIs go as 1 over x minus. In that case, I have the simple uh, light cone action as before. But the price to pay is that there is some uh, extra condition on the gauge parameter, on the, on the large gauge transformations, which uh, kill a part of the symmetry. So we only have uh, some of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions. But uh, if I keep the uh, this boundary field phi, uh, so our fields are now order 1, in that case, I have a boundary term in the action, and uh, then I don't have any extra conditions on the gauge parameter, so we, we have the full set of large gauge transformations. What we learn from this simple exercise is that the boundary conditions uh, enter the game in the light cone uh, approach in a bit of an uh, indirect manner, so one has to be very careful about uh, how to deal with them. And in an effort to understand this, uh, this problem better, we, we made some progress into simple problems. So this one, uh, this is a work uh, we did with Glenn Barnish, Simone Especial, and Wendy Tan, where we looked at 2D chiral bosons. Uh, and, and the reason we chose that is because it's a classic problem in canonical quantization, and we wanted to prove that, okay, the way uh, we typically do it you, in instant form, where we quantize uh, as x naught being the time, is the same as doing a uh, a light cone quantization, and we wanted to prove that. 
and uh, then I'll tell you a bit about how all of this story links to Carol Carolian physics if I have time. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, this is the issue that we were looking at: how to account for boundary conditions or zero modes uh, in the light cone formulation. And uh, we wanted to reproduce this well-known uh, partition function for 2D chiral bosons. Thank you. And uh, we wanted to do it in the light cone formulation. Now, if you look at the equation of motion for 2D bosons uh, in in light cone coordinates, you you immediately see that okay, there are left movers and right movers, but what we found very hard to do was to reproduce this this particle uh, zero mode contribution the uh, square root tau uh, tau two, and uh, but, uh, that's why we uh, did a canonical or Hamiltonian analysis where we saw that in the general solution uh, from the Hamiltonian equations of motion we see that there is a part of the initial data which lies on on this front, a part of the data lies on that front. And you must also consider a matching condition at the intersection. So this again reminds us of something which is similar to, to the asymptotic structure of space-time where you need uh, matching conditions at, at spatial infinity. And uh, this is just a summary of the key results we found. Uh, I, let me just talk about this last point a bit. So uh, we wanted to prove that quantizing along this periodic boundary condition is the same as doing it uh, in a null direction and we found that one has to take uh, that one has to quantize in both the fronts and uh, match at the intersection meaning that we have to treat both x plus and x minus as time and uh, which tells us that there is there are sort of two notions of time in the light cone approach and this is how it uh, links to carolian physics I don't have much time, so I'm just going to rush over this a little bit. So uh, the two notions of time that I want to talk about are uh, already proposed in this uh, paper in 2014, where one time coordinate is the usual Newtonian time, the other one behaves like a Carolian time. So let's say if I choose x plus as the usual time, as I have been doing, then x minus is a Carolian sort of uh, time coordinate. And uh, so and in the, this, this is all, all the Poincaré algebras in light cone coordinates. So the red ones uh, satisfy a Bergman algebra, and the blue one here is the Galilean algebra that Suskin found uh, many years ago. And the green one within this Bergman algebra is a Carolian algebra. Now uh, there are actually two copies of the, these kind of subalgebras because uh, you can take the other way around. You can choose x minus to be Newtonian and x plus to be Carolian then uh, you have a different set of Bergman, Carroll, and Galilean algebra. And uh, th these subgroups have different uh, physical relevances. For instance, the Carroll groups are the stability groups of, of the two light -like fronts. I will just quickly show you uh, one uh, nice consequence of the Carrollian aspect of light cone field theories. So if you just focus on the scalar field action in light cone coordinates, uh, and uh, look at the conjugate momenta, you'll immediately see that this is a constraint because it's a first order in time derivative. Uh, and if you compute the Hamiltonian density uh, for this sc scalar field action, we find that there are no del plus or uh, pi terms in the Hamiltonian action. And this is a feature of Carolian uh, Hamiltonian actions. Furthermore, you can prove that the Poisson bracket algebra with this Hamiltonian densities are zero. Crucially for Lorentzian spacetime, this is non-zero. But for Carolian space times, this must be zero. So the, this tells us that uh, light cone Hamiltonians derived in this way are typically Carolian. So this sort of gives us a, a shortcut to obtaining Carolian field theories from Lorentzian ones. And OK, yeah, this is my last slide. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so just to summarize a little bit, I went over it a bit fast. So I apologize for that. But the, the two main lessons I, uh, I think uh, we learned from this is that it, to, to understand boundary conditions, Properly, we must consider both the fronts and the matching conditions. And light cone field theories are nice in the sense that you can, you can see both Galilean and Carolian features uh, depending on how you look at them. And of course, there is a long to-do list of things to do. For exa example, uh, building a dictionary between light cone symmetries and asymptotic symmetries and so on. There is a recent preprint where they have tried to do this a little bit. The ambitious goal is, of course, to uh, explore flat space holography in this context. There is uh, another recent preprint pre where they, uh, where the authors have tried to explore these ideas. But from uh, from a more practical purpose, uh, I think 
practical point of view, I think there are some modest goals which we can achieve, which is either to learn more about light cone theories from a Carolian perspective, for instance, to, know, uh, to see that, the, okay, the Hamiltonians are magnetic Carol in nature, or to learn more about Carolian field theories from light cone uh, theories. What I mean by that is uh, there is a wealth of literature on light cone quantization, and we know we, one has to understand how to quantize Carolian field theories uh, in the Carolian, Carolian holographic program. So maybe looking at those can help us uh, learn a bit more about the quantization problem and so on. And that's all I wanted to <laughs> tell you. Thank you. Questions. Uh, thanks for the talk. Can you say again what was the um, problem with the zero mode in your scalar uh, example? In the scalar example? Uh, okay. So, uh, and did you get it in the end? Yes, we, we got it in the end because earlier we were uh, just, uh, so, okay, I, I skipped a lot of details here. This is just f uh, what you get from the uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion, but when you quantize this theory, if I had chosen just x plus to be the time and set up a symplectic form and Poisson bracket and then we do a canonical quantization, uh, we, in, the, in the partition function expression, we will get either of this uh, eta left, so the, what happens is if I take one coordinate to be uh, time, then I would either get the left uh, moving sector or the right moving sector, and the other sector is sort of entangled with the zero mode, uh, zero mode contribution. So in order to get all three of them, the, the square root factor, the eta and the eta bar, we have to do, uh, we have to take both x plus and x minus to be time and quantize them and then match them consistently at the intersection. But is this different from what you would do in that CFT textbook? Yes, because uh, in the CFT textbook we do this red thing where you have x naught as time and you take a periodic boundary condition in the spa spatial direction, x, x1. Okay, so now go to Polchinski, would, it, would that be different from... Uh, yeah, yeah. So this, uh, and but, now if you want to do it in x, x plus x minus, you need to take periodic boundary conditions in both x plus x minus meaning that both of them uh, are being treated as time. Or yeah, you have to I'd use pile brackets, so. Okay, I don't want to monopolize the, but I'll, I'll Yeah, yeah, it, it's a bit uh, counterintuitive, <laughs> I have to okay, but the point is, are you saying something that when, you know, you teach string theory 101, you should do it differently, or? No, 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 I'm just saying, if I want to uh, do it this way, uh, using just x plus, uh, do you mean light cone quantization in general, or? Okay, it's just taking, uh, okay. sorry, sorry, I'm taking too long, no, I'll come to you after. Okay, yeah. Sorry, thank you. Uh, maybe we have time for one more quick, qu quick question. Going once, <laughs> going twice, sold. Well, of course, we can uh, thank Shushetta again for a great talk.